All right, we're back here, Blathering Conversations, the third episode in an ongoing series where I face my demons, and by that I mean get over my laziness and get back to interviewing wonderful people I know and help them get the word out on wonderful things and also talk about life, the universe, whatever comes up. And right now, today, on screen, you're seeing the lovely face of one of the loveliest, nicest people I've ever met in comedy, and I want to ask him if that makes him wretch when I say it. It is actor, <laughs> comedian, author, a uh, public piano player matt knutson that's true uh thank you ken thank you for having me a pleasure does not begin to cover it this is great we've known each other since uh, the mid 2000s but we don't always get to uh be in the same circles i think i hadn't seen you for a few years and we had our friend uh, josh paget's wedding i was like yeah i'm so happy to that's see you right. happy for the yeah. marriage but happy to see you <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I think Josh is doing good. Now he's uh, the president of Dadco. I believe he's got two, yeah. two youngins now. And, um, doing, you know, great. shout out to him if he's listening to this episode. Paget, uh, uh, one of my favorites, too, as well. And uh, yeah, for those uh, who uh, you know, have been following me for a while, you know, my journey with stand up, it has some ups and downs. And, 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 and Matt's one of the folks that uh, I'll kiss his ass now has always been one of my favorite to watch. <laughs> To Thanks, Ken. study and and how to tell a joke. You never want to copy someone's style, but I saw an, I saw a review of one of your albums, and it said that Matt Knutson's delivery is almost hypnotic, and that's so true. <laughs> <laughs> so true. Thanks. You know, um, there I, I go back and I like watch all these like old videos. I've, I've been lucky enough to do stand up for twenty two years, wow. and I go like watch something from like you know, 15 years ago or like to even 10 years ago when you're sitting at that point in your career, we're just like, boy, how come more things aren't happening? Just like, oh, I know. I'm terrible. Uh, <laughs> I'm ter <laughs> you, know, you watch these videos, you're just like, you know, yeah. I didn't do an album until I had been doing comedy for nine years. I put out my first album after nine years because I knew I wasn't very good. Well, that, that, I mean, I'm not, I, I'm not grabbing the spotlight to put it back on me, but uh, this sure. coming week, I released my first comedy EP uh, in my day, live at the Harrison Pub in London, and it took me 20 years, but I quit for about a total of 10, so it's about the same yeah. thing, and I'm actually encouraged to hear you say that. It it, 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 it takes a bit, and I think there's some, something to what you're saying of like. Look, I, I can tell you, I knew you back in the day. You didn't suck, but I know what you mean. <laughs> Thanks. You know? Thank you. And congratulations on the album, Ken. So cool. Thank you. And, and also, what I did want to, I don't want to do boring interview housekeeping stuff, but some of you, uh, you, you definitely have seen Matt. Some of you are looking at the screen, you're going, <laughs> wait a minute, wait a minute. It's shrinking. Uh, George, Let me take my glasses off. Yeah, there off. you go. Keep going. Right. There you go. On Malcolm in the Middle. I mean, that 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 was it. That you were you were the top dog back in the day, I dude. I, I have to say, when you say like whatever your like big break was, um, I did I did it in tw like twenty years ago, literally twenty years ago, and it was the first time that I was on a show that I watched and loved. Mm. And so you, when you feel like this, there's this big disconnect between you and the industry, and you're just like. I'm an actor, I'm a director, I'm a writer, whatever you think you you are, sometimes people open the door and let you in and it doesn't feel as far away yeah. uh, when moments like that happen. So uh, there's a, uh, one of the chapters in the book is called Brian Cranston. And it's just my story with Malcolm in the middle and um, you know the, the person that he is. The thing about this book is, uh, you know, it's called, have I seen you in anything? Cause that's the question I get a lot. Yeah. So I put like my my Casey Kasem esque top forty stories into one book, but instead of like a like a dishy tell all, yeah. all the stories are positive and uplifting. So when you hear a story about someone, you're just like, hey, guess what? Dick Van Dyke's the best. When we spent time together, this was how he was. Yeah, you know. So you don't have to like try and be dishy or yeah. or or. Or talk, you know, talk a bunch of uh, stuff behind someone's back. People like to hear that, and that kind of moves things. 
I don't like that. I'd rather hear like, <laughs> you know, hey, you know what? Give, give Alicia Silverstone her flowers because she's a wonderful woman. <laughs> this is I can't wait to. Yeah, the book is called Have I Seen You in Anything? True Hollywood Stories from a Guy That Seems Familiar. Uh, available this week on Amazon by the time this episode comes out. Just search Matt Knudsen. That's K-N-U-D-S-E-N. And don't say <laughs> don't say Knudsen. It's Knudsen. <laughs> it's like Paddle a Canoe. Yeah. That's the one I give to the opener at the at the comedy club yeah. you know it's always so, such a stressful part of doing shows is like remembering like the five or six people's names <laughs> oh yeah yeah. <laughs> yeah and then I, yeah you could cut newton and knapsack throws people for a loop but yeah then there's the you know if you're giving credits at a comedy club it's like this right. thing and that and get me on stage and now you, you got the, the comics are like all right first i appeared on like just get us on stage oh, so, dude. It, it seems to tie and i would definitely want to talk some stand-up stories and philosophies with you here great but because of your book and where we're going and i want people to check it out because this this is your vibe too and doesn't mean you don't have bad days you don't have some takes or you don't have a great series of political tweets that just say diarrhea which are some of my favorite things <laughs> um, we'll, we'll talk about that um but yeah uh, these are stories. These are good stories about people being good. Like I, I've, I met Brian Cranston for five seconds in the room five, a Malfi restroom. If you remember, wow. we, we do the shows there. Of course. He was buds with Javier Grajeda, who's doing stand up, And I ran into him and it was the best five second ex exchange in a bathroom I've ever had Dude. with a human. Incredible. Yeah. Um, there, that I, I, I name check Javier too. Yeah. When uh, Brian and Javier first moved to Los Angeles, they were roommates. So they were they were making it, you know, trying to make good in, in Hollywood together. And Javier, people will remember him from uh, from Breaking Bad and Better Call Saul. He was the Mexican drug conciliary, the 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 ball guy who was the um, I, what's the name of the family? The I don't know that I'm blanking on the name, but the drug family from them. He, he, you'll, you'll see a face and you're like, ah, but they they came up together and are still real tight. That's that's that speaks uh, volumes of, of both as humans. And, and these are nice stories. And that's what I, I wanted to start with in a big way. Like if someone says your name, generally speaking, mm -hmm. it's going to be, ah, man, just a good dude. And in a world, oh, thanks, man. But in a world of stand up comedy, acting in Hollywood and you've been on the strike line, still are. Um, but it, it stand up comedy is a special breed of, of, of cruddy. <laughs> it's a special dark, dank pit. Uh, how does that, how do you react to that? How do you, do you take the compliment? Do you wish you were edgier? Are you edgier and you just want people to see it? What is Matt Knudsen the nice guy mm. like? Boy, that's a great question. You know, I honestly, I don't even like book myself as like a clean comic. It's just like, Hey, have me at your church. I'm going to be fine. It's just like, I have a, a, a little bit of grit. I have mm -hmm. a little, you know, but it's not the stuff that I'll always do on stage because I'd always said my shows are kind of like all ages mm -hmm. and you can like, Hey, if it's, uh, I, it only cuts the other way in my experience. If someone's like super blue, yeah. you know, they, they, people leave in the club, they're like, man, he sure talked about. Yeah internet porn a lot and you're like you know or whatever the subject is where you're like mm. um so i don't really do a lot of that stuff i don't do a lot of hot takes it's more i, I i'm more in like the the jim gaffigan brian regan totally frame of mind because especially too when i was coming up it was still late night uh spots and yeah. i didn't want to write anything that i couldn't do on the tonight show that was kind of my standard it's, uh, you know, it, I think that's smart, especially for them, uh, for then. And um, I heard that a few times and, and I, I, I'm a little looser and not grittier and intentionally like challenging, but I just, I love swearing uh, more than I right. have to admit. And so it's found its way, but in the back of my head is what you're talking about. Uh, that, right. That's, that's not just upward mobility for clicks and algorithms sake. That's a, that's a good way to approach comedy in a, in a general way. yeah thanks ken well if it helps so uh, i had a show on friday night at, in your neck of the woods yeah. san luis obispo so uh there's actually the slow funny i'm going to give a shout out to uh you know to the slow funny scene up there uh, mm -hmm. they do a, a brian um, there's a guy why i'm blanking on his last name you, you've been traveling anyway you don't you don't you know, you, drug cartels are last name right now <laughs> I don't, I don't do last names, but, uh, he runs the slow, um, shows and they do monthly shows up there, mm. but, uh, they had like a kind of a dirty show at the, uh, you know, at the, the second show was like a dirty show. And some guy was like, like talking about like, is this a, 
this is the internet, right? I can say anything I want. Yeah. So this guy's like talking about like sucking his own dick. And I was just like, Comment. so I'm like, I'm following him. I'm like, and I was just like, well, guys, um, I'm going to make this a little bit uncomfortable for everyone. Uh, ladies, every single man in this room at some point in their life, maybe between the age of 12 and 15, has tried to suck their own <laughs> dick. So, and then they, they could feel people like, oh, you know, and I was like, but here's the thing, guys. Um, you know, when you get older and you get a little more life experience, you just realize you can pay a guy to suck it for you. <laughs> You know, <laughs> so, I didn't want to like not say the thing I thought was funny because I was just like, oh, the, well, I don't know. The, yeah, it's yeah. it's a sliding scale for sure. It's also. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I've been I've been on those shows where like uh, someone before me, whether they're good or bad, doesn't matter. But someone's doing something pretty intense. And yeah, in my head, I'm like, I'm already defeated because I just. I got. I can't pick up that ball and run with it. I just gotta, I gotta leave it there. <laughs> leave it there. Um, tell me, uh, without spoiling this book here, you got Cranston. Sure. You have a yeah. You've met uh, President Barack Obama. You have on your list. Yeah. I'm dying to read it. The Bangles. Oh, thanks, dude. The Bangles. I'm a huge Susanna Hoffs fan. Yeah. Uh, still making yeah. music, writing books herself. Oh, what are some dude. of your favorite stories from some of these favorite people? Well, the, um, the, the elevator pitch when, uh, uh, you know, when I talk to people, I'm, I can say, and this is all coming from like a Midwest Lutheran who just shrugs his shoulders at things. And he's like, yeah, I guess, yeah, you know, yeah. I'm like, aw, shucks is my default. Cause you talk about yourself too much. And then suddenly you're like, oh, I'm so great. It's just like, you believe it. A friend of mine said that, uh, I have kind of a, a Forrest Gump element to my life where you just you just kind of say yes and you show up and you're just in these in these places and i mean i was at warner brothers like three or four days ago and i was walking the picket line and i was just like oh hey pedro pascal hey buddy you know yeah we're suddenly we're standing there hanging out and it's just because you were there um but it's uh, the elevator pitch has been uh, i met president obama in the white house mm. I met Hugh Hefner in the Playboy Mansion, and William Shatner asked me to call him Bill. So they're all true stories of things that just kind of happened to me, mm. but they were almost thumbnail sketches where you're like, oh, I remember that happened. Oh, yeah. This was the first time I actually sat down and did some research and actually trying to focus my memory yeah. in, uh, in, a, in, a, in a total recall way. But also explain some uh, inside baseball for some industry things and uh, try and illuminate it for all audiences. That's amazing. What um, is there? A, is there a, a key, a, a point of uh, approach or strategy as someone you know, like you, who's meeting a lot of people either through work or just some of the circumstances I'm sure have popped up in your life? Is there a key sure. to having a good interaction with someone like this? Is is there a way you can help influence it, or is it just all dependent on them? Um, I think I would say this, if someone famous wants to talk to you, they will. Yes. But if you're on set and you're trying to be like, you know, hey, Michael Douglas. Hey, buddy. Hey, what's up? Uh, all those sets, I just bring a book mm -hmm. and I sit in the corner and I try and stay out of the way because I've just been like number six on the call sheet. Yeah. And then you're like, you look over and it's just like, it's Michael Douglas and Alan Arkin, and they're talking to Chuck Lorre. And you, you, what are you going to like elbow your way in there? Hey, guys. <laughs> All right. Here we go. Hey Don't forget about me, yeah. the guy who's working two days on the project. <laughs> what? <laughs> so I would say I, less is more would be my advice. Yeah, that's a great that's a great approach. Yeah, there, you don't want to be too thirsty. Um, I also think you don't want to be so cavalier that if the window's open for you to have a nice interaction, like, you know, take it, but, but don't, don't push the, the envelope is, is, is agreed. Yeah. Yeah. If you, have you, uh, well, we don't want to get negative. I, was, I don't want to name names, but you've probably, you could sure. probably fill a book with 80 bad interactions, but I love the Oh yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I didn't, um, do any of this in the book, but I mean, I've been on sets where like, like the lead actress, like thought I had too many lines and like took some of my lines. And I was just like that. What really made me laugh was I was like a murder suspect and she's like interviewing me. I was the perp 
And so it's just, she and I sit in at this like police investigating table and she started to guess information that she would have no way of knowing. You know, she's like, where were you last night? Let me guess. It was da, 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 da. So she took my lines that were responses to her questions. And I was just like, I, I was in, I was in disbelief yeah. for one. For two, it was the story of an actress caring more about her screen time and her like, yeah. than the actual story and the actual, like, what would make sense. Mm. So at a certain point, I, I, mm. I clicked into a mode where I was just like, okay, well, uh, I'm not going to like, uh, I'm going to be out of here at like 6 PM and I'm never going to come back. So, mm -hmm. but I have had those stories too, where I think it's a lot of ego and insecurity. Mm. And I, I feel for them in a certain sense before we did that scene, um, she had a tantrum and wouldn't come out of her dressing room for two hours. So, there so I'm sitting there waiting and I'm just like, <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> and there's and, and, and that's not you. That's not about you. It's not even about her. It's about the circumstance, the career, the path to that moment, her life. Up totally. Up. Yeah, I mean, some uh, some of the nicest um, people in the world are the most successful people, mm. and they have nothing to prove. Mm. Like I, I, uh, uh, my dream is to one day work with Ron Howard. I would love to because everything I hear by all accounts, he's just like. Hey, you know, you know, hi, I'm Ron. And you're like, I, I, yeah, you are. Yeah, you are. I, I, I came so close to meeting him because, uh, I, I love going to the smokehouse and, and oh, classic, classic. Let's go, let's go to lunch, Matt. When you're back from your tour, let's go. We'll do it. Dude. And, and we'll do it. I was there for my birthday last year and there was someone in the corner that had, there was, oh, there's always a lot of birthdays. There was someone else in the corner who had a birthday. The cake came out, there was some singing and I couldn't see it. And, and, and my contacts, you ever like your con, my contacts were fogging up and I was kind of, <laughs> I don't care who's having a birthday, but there was someone in a multicolor like sweater, almost like a big Lebowski sweater. I was like, that's interesting. Well, they get up to leave. Yeah. And it's Clinton Ron Howard. It was Clint's birthday. And wow. ev every ounce of energy from them was just two brothers out on a dinner. And just the night, and I and I told my fiance Grace, I was like, I, I really because I love the movie solo that, that Ron picked up and directed and, and Clint's in it. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, I, I want to run up and just hug them, but I just I think that will violate the contract that we all have. Agreed. <laughs> <laughs> this is not the way. Right. <laughs> totally. Yeah. yeah. And then, you know, especially being uh Hollywood kids to grow up and still be uh, be that balanced and kind and yeah. focused and they didn't there are a lot of pitfalls growing up as you know a hollywood actor kid crazy to think yeah their um uh their father who passed away the last couple of years he used to get his hair cut downtown burbank where i get my hair cut he used to get uh, nice walked over there downtown burbank uh uh right so was that um um and also thanks to uh rance howard my yeah. bacon number is one mm. one yes I'm, I'll, the only way i can get closer is to do a project with <laughs> with uh kevin bacon but thanks to their dad rance there you go um that's a that's a he the, the bacon he was in apollo 13 and then i we did some kind of like murder mystery movie i didn't didn't work with it but we were all we like, you know yeah. my partner was rick overton overton love overton yeah we were cops <laughs> overton oh some nights at the improv just listening to a uh uh, a very talkative Overton talk to everyone about comedy memories, <laughs> memories. Uh, still focusing on the book here before we get to some other things. So I, I don't, I, sure. I don't want to spoil this for people who are about to read this book and check it out again on Amazon. Have I seen you in anything? Matt Knudsen's 40 stories here of meeting these uh, famous people. Uh, <laughs> uh, so are there, are they all surreal or are they are some of them just so normal? Like I got to imagine being in the White House meeting the president's kind of surreal, but I don't know, hanging out with Alicia Silverstone, I don't know the circumstances, but is it is there a difference or are they all kind of bizarre in their own wonderful way? They're all kind of bizarre in their own wonderful way. Some are just kind of like happenstance where, you know, like Alicia Silverstone, we, I did an episode of a show called American Woman, mm. and it was just like a two person scene. I was her doctor and she had some, some uh, bad medical news. Uh, some of them I just happened to like my first Hollywood uh, celebrity sighting when I moved to LA was Fred Willard. And, uh, I was, I was at Cantor's and, uh, somebody had like ripped up, 
a newspaper stand on the sidewalk and thrown it out onto Fairfax. And so like cars were um, swerving around it. And I was just like, it was total chaos. Yeah, yeah. So I went into the street and grabbed the newspaper stand and like pulled it back to the <laughs> sidewalk. And so at least, you know, people can move again. You're and as I'm pulling it, um, this pair of feet approach as I'm looking down and a man's voice said, this city needs more citizens like you. <laughs> and I looked up. And it was Fred Willard. <laughs> and I was just like, that's my first one remains undefeated. That's and that, undefeated. That's a great Willard. You did, you did his tone perfectly. Right. Thank you. Willard. And then eight years later, mm. uh, he went on to play my father in a movie that changed my life mm. and allowed me to act full time mm. after that, after that job, it was a cartoon network show called out of Jimmy's head. It was reanimated. And after I did that, it was, uh, mm. Mm. I don't want to say off to the races because like every year is different, but I, it, at least there was enough like momentum and, you know, uh, uh, forward movement. I want that's, a, I, that's yeah. I, I want to get to some career stuff, not just in terms of the resume stuff and, and, and talk about more of the stories here, but uh, you, you mentioned you're doing comedy now, 22 years. You've been in a, in a lot of, of, of uh, wonderful things and, and, and including sketch comedy, some work over at Acme and many other places. Thanks Ken. Uh, but the, there's still a lot of perseverance and we're seeing it right now. We're seeing this time with the strikes, uh yes wj D, wga wrapped up dga wrapped up long they're so long uh oh, it's just heroes they wrapped up so long <laughs> um sag at the moment of this recording still you know negotiating and hopefully getting back to the table wednesday but it's challenged a lot of of people pursuing this art and comedy is one that is a punch to the face often uh acting is a punch to the face almost with every audition except for the ones that that hit uh, right. dig in with me a little bit about making the choice to do this kind of career. And you mentioned it, Hey, a movie that changed my life, but that's not the end of the journey either. Cause there's no really finish. <laughs> right. no, really finish right. no, it's, no, it's not. Yeah, it's not. Um, I think it's so, so cliche to say if you can do anything else, mm -hmm. but not only that, but the pursuit requires a lot of joy. In addition to grit, you really have to love it. Mm. Um, I, I'm not a Buddhist, but I've read Buddhism. And uh, there's, when you hear someone say like, I'm practicing Buddhism, mm -hmm. what they're practicing are these six things, you know, and my favorite of the practices is something called, that they call joyous pursuit. Wow. If you're going to do something, do it with a little bit of levity, do it with some wind in your sails, really be into it. Cause if you're, if you're doing it because you're like waiting for some kind of payday or waiting for some kind of gig, that's going to like take you to the next level. Finally, I can mm. hang out with these people who, you know, mm. it, it's too hard. It takes too long and it's too hard along the way to do it with a chip on your shoulder. Mm. So I think I've been lucky enough uh, to hear, hear yeses but most of them have been no's. Yeah. But at least that there was kind of, you know, you you felt like you were in the mix mm. and the right people were seeing you. And mm. I just tried my best. Yeah. And I'm sure there were a lot of years when my best wasn't good enough. You going into these auditions, you don't have the seasoning, you don't have the the skill set or the confidence or the mm -hmm. actually uh you were talking about the strikes mm -hmm. so this is another story from the the book but i saw this woman today at the strike uh her name is april webster she's an incredible casting director mm -hmm. but she casts like alias with jennifer garner and you just if you look up april webster she's like vaunted casting mm -hmm. i went into an audition for her and jj abrams oh. and it went so bad. I, I, fa I, I failed so hard, Ken. It was just like, I, this was like 18 years ago and I still like lay in bed like, what did I do? <laughs> so what happened was like, I was, I didn't even have a commercial. Uh, I didn't have a theatrical agent. I got this um, audition through my commercial agent. JJ Abrams was directing uh, a promo or like a commercial for the DNC. 
And so he's looking for like commercial guys. And I was kind of like this Midwesty farmhand guy. And it's like, don't tell me America, you know, that we can't make America, uh, you know, great for our kids and you know, all this stuff. So I had like one line and I went in there and I was like so nervous. And my, I just got cotton mouth. I couldn't, I couldn't, the line was like seven words, but I couldn't remember it. And I was just, got a bad. I, and so I was like, ah, got a bad. don't tell me. Our kids. And like, so JJ is sitting directly next to the camera and he's about four or five feet away. He's like sitting in the chair next to the camera and he kind of reaches out and pats me on the knee. He's like, Hey, it's okay, buddy. <laughs> he's just like, <laughs> and, Hey, hey, saying one line is hard. Don't you worry. A lot of dude. It's okay, buddy. And what I wrote in the book was like, if anyone in any industry tells you it's okay, buddy, it's not okay, buddy. Yeah. I, if, uh, I went in there, wanted a job. I didn't want a pep talk, yeah. you know, yeah. but it was just, it was the only time I had ever read for April Webster and JJ Abrams. And I choked and I never got another chance. Yeah. Wow. Did you bring that up today to all of her? Do you run into her? <laughs> I didn't see her. I did see some other um, casting directors that I've known mm -hmm. because uh, this was just a coincidence. I didn't know it, but they had a rally at Amazon Studios mm -hmm. for the, the casting directors are, were, are organized under the Teamsters. And right. This is kind of a newer thing for them. So they're a local 399 and they had a 399 rally of like, hey, we're going to all go. So I knew um, a number of people, and uh, so it was fun to connect. And, mm -hmm. you know, I think there's something to be said about just hanging out for 25 years. <laughs> yeah, you, you've been doing more than that. But, yes, there's the, the, the marathon, <laughs> not a sprint mentality definitely – is a uh, is an important thing, but I love I love what you're saying. Uh, uh, as I go up and down in, in my career in life, and I'm someone who've always struggled with self confidence. Who doesn't? But but of course, finding, it's crippling. Yeah, what do I want to do? What do I want to say? And who am I on stage? It's been a big thing. It's mm -hmm. made in the last few years. Uh, I'm a dramatically different comic than I was 10, 15, definitely 20 years ago when I started. And it's a problem. Oh, yeah. But but like. Uh, you know, this thing you're talking about this joyous pursuit. Uh, that's something that's been on my heart recently i wasn't smart enough to have that specific advice that you just gave but i'm just like i'm sure. about to start to really re up it on my podcast really kind of leaning into some other kind of areas of my life and it's like what am i i've been asking myself with each project what am i doing it for is it because i need to right. pay rent that's a good motivator but you can <laughs> or is it is it because this this is what i want to say and do and i right. do think there's a strong difference and and sometimes you got to survive Ain't no, ain't no problem with surviving. Uh, mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and, and I know you get that, but, but yeah, I, I love that advice that you're saying of just like, yeah. So the, the six, per, the six perfections are uh, generosity, ethics, patience, meditation, wisdom, and joyous pursuit. Love it. If you have all six of those things in your life and in some kind of balance or semblance, you're like, well, that's the whole deal right there. Can you be generous with people? Can you be patient with people? Can you, mm. you know, if you if you don't have all those things or at least a handful of them, maybe it's time to adjust the, you know. <laughs> go the other direction. <laughs> Better here or here? Better here or here? Yeah, go to the, <laughs> One, go to the career optometrist. Yeah, the career optometrist. <laughs> that's wonderful. I think we all have to sit in that chair at some point. Two, three. They both look the same. Pick one. Pick one. Right. Pick, one. Pick, one. Pick one. Can you read the fourth line? Can read I can't read the first line. I'm in the wrong yeah. chair. Oh, that's <laughs> wonderful. We're talking with Matt Knudsen, uh, author, comedian, sketch comic, and public piano player. And we're going to ask him that. We're going to take a quick break here on the podcast <laughs> and the YouTube channel. Thanks for listening. Thanks for watching. Stick around. Matt Knudsen is going to play piano in a train station. Welcome back to the Blathering Conversations. Ken Napsok here with uh, Matt Knudsen. Uh, having a lot of fun uh, catching up with with uh, someone I see far too less of in this busy, busy world of comedy. And that Couldn't agree more. And, uh, and Ken, I've always thought you're an incredible renaissance man. <sighs> I'm sure you've heard that uh, said about you before, but uh, when I just think about your career and all the the splinters that it's had and all these directions and 
and your vast knowledge of so many things. It's super impressive. Well, I'm a song and dance man who neither sings nor dances, but it's, <laughs> it's a good thing. Uh, there's a lot to get to. We might get to some stuff here about comedy. I keep teasing that. I, I, I've been loving uh, picking comics brains about just comedy overall and all those kind of things. But there's a very important thing I want to talk about on your, uh, I think mostly, I think I'd see it on uh, on your Instagram page, but you put, probably put it on Twitter too. You go down to like, Grand Central Station in downtown LA where the trains are buzzing and the people are scurrying about and you sit down and you play piano and you run tape yes. on it. Tell me about That's true. magic. Well, it's just a union station downtown yeah. in, uh, yeah. in Alameda and they, as long as the station's open, they, they, have a, they have a public piano that they just leave open for anyone and there's a little sign on it that says like hey if people are waiting play about 10 minutes you know but if no one's there you can just kind of sit there and play mm. and one day i took my iphone and i just stuck it in the corner and i'm, I'm not even really on any of the videos i i'm yeah. just wearing a dodgers yeah. hat yeah. And, yeah. but for me it, it incorporates a couple of things that i really love of music and like learning a new song and playing it or just jamming around and people watching. Yeah. So it's a big wide shot of all these people and all those crosses. And it, it actually looks like if there was like an assistant director, it's like, all right, cue the guy on the scooter, <laughs> you know, all right, get the, send the, the eight uh, Hispanic children, yeah. you know? So they just, it, it I just watch them and the, yeah. the videos are 45 a minute. And I usually just play covers of songs that people know. Uh, it's it, you're so right. It does look like it's it's staged in a way, and I, yeah, and I, I started at Grand Central Station. I, I'm going to New York in two weeks. Union Station, uh, cool, which is a fantastic place to be. There's a, there's also a bar at the state. A lot of people head to Union Station. Fun place to hang. Oh yeah, tracks. Wow. My, one of my favorite videos is I I never even saw this, but I like watched it later, and and it was this guy who was like sitting on a motorized suitcase. So he like he just sat and he just zzzz, and he zipped through the background. And I was just like, <laughs> all right, first of all, I didn't know that existed. Yeah. And secondly, you are an expert at this motorized suitcase, oh, sir. What is that? Guy? That's all. Yeah, I, I want to go to that moment in that guy's life where he, where he either discovered it or realized that's what he wanted because that would solve all of his problems <laughs> at the station. I, I take yeah, care. I mean, I think there was that, and then it was the divorce. <laughs> you know, <laughs> honey, I don't know. Get out of here. Yeah. And stand in my way. Don't take. Don't stop me from my dream of riding a motorized suitcase to a train station. <laughs> Have people interacted with you? And you've done it at other spots too. I, I, I was uh, saw some footage elsewhere, but uh, do people? How many people interact, or how many people in this big crazy city just go ahead hey, sure. and piano? Sometimes people um, will come over and talk and maybe like applaud or something like that. One time uh, a guy kind of accosted me and he's like, Hey, you better, you better know what you're doing if you're going to do this. And, you know, I was like, uh, you know, but shaking. it's mostly all been positive. So I'll, I'll go down there. I'll take the train down there. I'll play for a little bit. I'll get myself a cinnamon Wetzel's pretzel. You know, you gotta have, yeah. <sighs> And then uh, it's it's just fun. And even if I wasn't recording it, there's something about music that has a way to fill the space and just changes the way people feel. God, yeah. See, you are you are the Renaissance man. You're you're a, you're a <laughs> uh, philosopher and artist going down and making people's lives. They don't even real the guy in the motorized suitcase doesn't realize that he's got a <laughs> just for that second. <laughs> <laughs> all four seconds of the song he heard as he sped <laughs> towards the f train going to anaheim <laughs> really gotta get that anaheim we gotta get that gotta get part. To oh man is that piano man playing is that is that a cover of nirvana in a train station <laughs> oh my god Talk about i would say this yep. if you play piano that's the piano is always open at union station so just go down head there head there uh, talk about joyous pursuits. There you are. You found one there. Um, I uh, talk in comedy. If, if you don't mind diving a little bit into the wild world of stand up, you you are a, a very accomplished comic, and you've been on a lot of wonderful spots uh, back in the day when late night shows. You know when comics could get on them, and late night shows were, were that kind of thing. Uh, but up to even now, you were you, you had mentioned you're doing a tour right now. I think you have Houston left 
Uh, so if anyone, yeah, I'm going to, um, yeah, I have some folks who are going to be, I, at yeah, I have some folks out and sorry, I'm cutting you off. I apologize. Uh, Please. Uh, I have some people I know who are in the Houston area who listen, go check out Matt. Where are you at? Hey, now I'm going to be at the riot mm. comedy club one night only Thursday, October 5th. There we go. So, um, go. yeah, that's, it should be a fun show. And then, uh, next weekend, uh, the 13th and 14th, I'm at the, um, the Copa Club in Ventura Harbor. Mm. Uh, that's uh, I think both shows are 7 p.m. And then October 21st, I'm going to be in uh, Salt Lake City. That's a Saturday. That's uh, one show right now, but I think it's getting close to sold out. So maybe they're going to add another one. So SLC uh, uh, represent. <laughs> what? Are, uh, when are they doing comedy shows in Salt Lake? 3 p.m. Is it 3 p.m. now? Are they correcting it? 4 p.m. <laughs> Late start, late show. <laughs> totally, <laughs> totally. Yeah, I got my uh, uh, all my uh, um, followers from Big Love. They're like, okay, they're, they're sending the Mormon out. That's right. Yeah, yeah. It's beautiful. One of us. One of us. But it's uh, from my from my vantage point as someone who has struggled at different times over the years to find out um, who I want to be on stage. And I apologize to my mm -hmm. listeners for repeating some of the story, but there's a I'm a big David Bowie fan, and there's a moment in 1971 where history records it as a great. Uh, accomplishment for Bowie playing changes at a festival in, in Edinburgh. And, and, and the truth of the matter is, or Glastonbury, I uh, uh, forget now, but the truth of the matter is he played in front of, at, at 5 a.m. in front of nobody. And it's an acoustic version of a lot of the songs he would go on to release later, including changes. And, 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 and the narration of the doc, 1971, the year that music changed everything, says that David Bowie at this point in his life did not know he knew what he wanted to be in his mind, but he did not know how to get it out on stage. And that—that that is a lot mm -hmm. of what I have struggled with or have now tried to overcome as a, not just a comic, but as a writer, as a person, quite frankly. Sure. You know, of course. It's easy for me to, to look at uh, Matt Knudsen's set, that eight minutes he did at the improv the night I hosted. Brilliant. And, and, I, and I love your style and, and you're, you're down, your beats are down to the word and I love it. But, but uh, how did you arrive at that? How did you know who Matt Knutson is on stage? Did it come mm. early? Did it change? I'm fascinated with that side. Um, I think it came. That's a good question. I don't know if I was ever like right when I started, it would be like, all right, here's exactly what I'm going to do, right. you know, right. and then you have every word. I mean, one of those uh, videos that I was talking about, you watch it back now and you're like, oh, <laughs> <laughs> was like my um, late night television debut on the late, late show with Craig Ferguson. Mm. It was April 2nd, 2007. And I can't, I can't even watch it. Really? It's just so crazy because at the time I was telling these really kind of um, dry one liners mm -hmm. and, you know, kind of jokes. And, and I was like, so cocksure in the writing and the materials i could just like i just would stand there at the at the microphone stand and just kind of tell the jokes and it'd be a little not glib but you know have a, a twinkle in your eye kind of thing whatever but uh, i did that on the late late show i still i said yeah just leave the mic stand out and i'll just tell the jokes there and the set went really, really well. You know, I remember it as a win. Mm. But I look at it now and like the microphone's still there and it's like covering like 30% <laughs> of my face. It's just like, mm. you idiot, yeah. you know? And then, you know, you, you take a, a, a learning example like that and you kind of build on it. I mean, one of my, one of my favorite quotes of all time is Bruce Lee. He said, I never lose, I win or I learn. Oh. You're like, yeah, that's a amen to that. Yeah. So when I did Conan five years later, I just wore a lapel mic. Yeah. Cause I was like, you know, Conan doesn't have a microphone and talk. He's just out there and he's like the, he's the guy they just put the pack on. So I tried to evolve in that way. And, um, hmm. One of the most influential experiences I had was with Louis Anderson. Hmm. I was at the Louis. improv. And I just bombed, I totally bombed. Like mm -hmm. uh, not even like, well, it was kind of okay. It was just terrible. And afterwards he came out to my set and he said, you didn't look like you were having a lot of fun up there. I was yeah. like, yeah, I wasn't. So he said, you know, you, uh, you, you seem like a really nice guy, but you never talk about that on stage. You should talk about that on stage. You seem so nice. He's like, I'm not right about, a lot of things, but I feel right about that. Wow. I was like, wow. okay, cool. And even if your, uh, your, your point of view is just like, 
you're you're the nice guy, but like, whew, man, have you tried to be nice lately? <laughs> it's not easy, you know, guys. Yeah, you know, so it's boy, people make nice challenging. <laughs> so, beautiful. So I was yeah. able to lean into a little bit more of who I am off stage and the person who's in this conversation with you right now. Mm. And there wasn't a disconnect where I like, I'm about to go on stage. Yeah. Do you think Chop Liver ever asks, well, what am I? Yeah. Hilarious. I'm really, dude, I'm really doing things now. Yeah. But yeah. I, I think it, it took a lot of uh, navigating. And even now, coming out of the pandemic, I'm yeah. touring a new show that I had never done before. Right. Which is, it's stand-up. But it's, I also play music. Mm -hmm. I have short films. There's uh, sketches. It's like an improv. Oh. I have a dance number. So oh, I call dance. it the one man variety show. Beautiful. And the elevator pitch is it's the Chappelle show meets Lawrence Welk. Salt. And Salt. It's, it's new for me every night because I have like this kind of PowerPoint deck mm. and I just kind of get into whatever I feel like doing. Wow. Uh, in, in in the moment. So if you end up talking to someone and for 10 minutes, you're like, well, I guess we're not going to get to this, you yeah. know, and it was so much more uh, rewarding and artistically fulfilling than I would have these weekends where you're doing like five shows mm -hmm. and somewhere in the middle of the third show, you're like, did I just say that already? Didn't I just say that? Right. Have I, am I repeating myself? You know, you have those moments of like mm -hmm. uncertainty and so I tried to have something that incorporated more of my creativity and my my art and my passions and things. That's beautiful. And then just do it and, and share it with a you know with a wider audience. I one of my favorite memories from this tour I just got off of. I was in Canada, and um, I did this show at this place called Hecklers, which is like a Canadian institution. It, it was really a great club, yeah. great crowd. But I, I finished my variety show and I'm leaving the stage. And as I walk past this old man, 72, 3, 4, he palms me a 20. And he's like, my wife and I would like to buy you a coffee. That was phenomenal. <laughs> I was like, hey, thanks, man. And at that same show, there was a guy celebrating his 21st birthday with like five friends. And all of them were like, yo, yeah, hey. So when I think about that 50 year window yeah. that all had a good time together, it made me feel very proud and grateful. That's beautiful. Yeah, no, I love this. First of all, proud and grateful in comedy is a hard thing to <laughs> be honest there, but uh, to take that risk. True. And, 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 it, 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 you know, this isn't a, a you're not um, going across no man's land, a World War One type of risk, but it's a risk as an artist and performer and yourself. Stand up is so much of us on stage. Anything in life that you put yourself out for is you exposed. And I'm, I'm sure the first night out running this through, whether you had your all your lines down and your PowerPoints in place. I'm sure there was a little bit Dude. of that doubt and fear in your back of your mind. Oh, God, a million percent. Actually, the first time I did the show was at a place called the Glendale Room here in the Los Angeles oh, area, Glendale. Um, Sh uh, Sean and Ann, they have a wonderful little space. So uh, it's an old, I think it used to be a clothing store or I, 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 some kind of like, it's a, it's a storefront space. Hmm on a walking street and when it's full it can hold 40 people right. and i was just like you know what i'm gonna i'm gonna try it here once it's kind of a proof of concept thing i'm gonna shoot it and just see what works and what doesn't work and so i sold it out uh you know in a, a couple weeks beforehand so i was like okay at least i at least i don't have to worry about the numbers i can focus more on the show so i focused on the show and then the night of the show like half of the people that bought tickets didn't show up yeah. and i was just like oh. <laughs> because there's like a brief rain like 11 hours <laughs> before like we better we better play it safe so i had this tape that i was i was kind of counting on to be um the blueprint and i was like okay this works this doesn't work it's good you know mm -hmm. so uh but it was i i the first time i did it i i i packed it with friendly 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 right, people right. just you know yeah. which yeah. But even like within the show, there's some things that I took from that first night 
and I continue to do them every show. And even though it's the same uh, bit, mm. it's new for me in the sense of like, like one of the one of the bits is like this uh, morning radio guy, like the KTZ in the zone, eighty nine nine. So I'm at my keyboard and I got my sunglasses on, and the bit is called KTZ and Community Calendar, guys. <laughs> but what I do is in any market I go cool. into, I take their call letters in their morning show yeah. and say like, you know, Heidi, Frosty, and Frank aren't in this morning. It's Maddie in the mornings, guys. But the community calendar is the bit. Yeah, yeah. And it's events that are happening in town this weekend, guys. But the event suggestions are things that people wrote down on slips of paper oh, as they entered God. the showroom. That's brilliant. So they walk in and, and it, the only um, prompt is it's a made it just, it's a made up event. You know, so, for example, Cloud Appreciation Day, the paperclip convention. So things that like so they i have someone from the theater bring up the bowl that's when people have that moment of like oh that's what that was for i draw the thing out i get i get to read i honor their suggestion and then i riff on it for 30 seconds a minute i do three four five announcements it's five to seven minute bit and it's fun for me too because i don't know i have no idea what they're gonna suggest mm -hmm. But then you also have like those things you can fall back on with the sound effects of the spring noise and the fart and the, you know, the morning zoo crew. So uh, <laughs> I haven't had this much fun performing comedy in a long, long time. A joyous pursuit indeed. That's And, and as someone who has read many a community calendar in my radio days, this is a ripe <laughs> uh, uh, field to, to pick there. Uh, that's totally, that's, that's absolute genius. You got to Yeah. To have fun and, 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 and do what you want to do on that stage, no matter how you do it, if it was a straight ahead set and you did 40 minutes, uh, I still think it would be brilliant, but, but it's, I, I can, I can hear the joy Louie looking above or probably looking up probably, probably, uh, would be like, I told you, I told you, <laughs> <laughs> I told you. Yeah. He was one of my favorite comedians growing up because yeah. he, even, uh, it's a story I share in the book. Even before I watched Louie, I didn't know what a callback was. Yeah. I didn't understand exactly that comedy concept until I saw him do it in a special when I was like 10 or 11, 12 years old. It was like, Wait, you can you can bring back something you mentioned before and get a bigger laugh? Yeah. Oh, that's brilliant. He was the master, the master. He was uh, my I, I I one time was hosting a show, the old Franco shows at the Improv. And Franco. Franco and I was hosting a show, as, but I was out there at the bar. I think it was between shows and Louie was going to drop in and do the late show. And uh, he's I'm sitting there with Franco. The, for those listening, is that Mark Franco is the producer of the show, comic himself from Boston. But we don't work at the improv. We're just doing a show out there and like comes in and we're like, Mark's like, hey, Louie, we'll, we'll bring you up here. You can do as much as you want. And he just turns to him and goes. That's great. I want some chicken tenders. It was, just, it was the <laughs> nicest request. He just wanted chicken tenders. That's my right. That's my right. <laughs> um, well, you know, if you find something wrong with chicken tenders, I dare you. I dare you to find it. Uh, in, in the time we have remaining, we're talking to Matt Knudsen. You all, I, now I feel like a morning radio guy. We're talking to Matt Knudsen here. Hey, everybody. Hey. Get out there. Uh, the, uh, Brought to you by Yellowstone Law. <laughs> have you or someone you know been the victim of a defective hernia mesh? Oh. Um, <laughs> uh, you, you've got this book coming out and have you have you put a book out before have you have you focused on something like that in the past no this is my first time i've literally lived in los angeles for half my life and i was like well yeah, let's let her rip you know why not also there's all these stories that like maybe you, you tell in like 30 seconds over a beer after a show mm -hmm. or at, at a dinner or something like that but they had never um i never flushed them out in this way so like every story is now like four five six pages where you can you know one bathroom visit yeah. per story yeah. and you know you, there's also not this um linear through line where you just like all right, it was 1998 and then in 2001. I think, at least for me, um, a, a lot of books that are out there, especially like comedy books or about comedians or written by a comedian, they appeal to fans of that comedian. 
But if you don't have, you know, if you're not the Jim Gaffigan or the, you know, the Brian Regan, maybe there are people, if they don't know you, you, they're probably not going to just find it and be like, yeah, this guy I've never heard of. I'd love to hear what he thinks. Yeah. But the, the gist of this one is like, my pitch is it's 20 feet from stardom. Yeah. But for from a character actor's point of view. So I'm not the biggest star in the book. I'm literally the smallest star <laughs> in the least. book, you know. Yeah. Jan from Toyota, which who she's yeah. a chapter, Laurel Coppock, Laurel she's Coppock. amazing. Great. Even That's she's a way bigger star than me. Yeah. That's amazing. No, it's a great approach. And, it, and I, I, like I said, I really, truly can't wait, wait to, to read it. Don't spoil on any anything. I want to I want to find out what happened in some. Thank part. you. Yeah. Uh, and then the pitch that I had been telling people is like, instead of a backstabby tell all, I throw people over the bus. <laughs> Not under over. Nice. <laughs> no, over. Help hey, you know what? Vermont, this help. person's wonderful. Yeah. If you like them already, I hope you love them even more after you hear like, Hey, you know, um, Adam Devine, um, friend of yours and mine and from the old yeah. scene, yeah. hasn't changed a bit. Class act yeah. helps others that, as good as it gets. That's good to hear. And, and we need those stories in these uh, in these troubled times, but they are yeah, these troubled times where, where kindness yeah. doesn't sail, you know? I agree. And I really do think that there's going to be a pendulum swing towards positivity and optimism. It's just yeah. been swinging to the other way for like six years and people have had enough and what i share with people when i'm on stage is i've had the good fortune of being going to every state hmm. and in every state everyone is friendly and warm and kind and decent and they look out for their friends neighbors and family mm -hmm. every state yeah so if you're under some impression there's some like bad states or bad people it's just like yeah there are dicks everywhere but that's life yeah i i really agree with that and, and i agree with that in the sense of you know with what with just the state of the world and by the way i always say this the world's pr probably always been pretty bad we can just tweet about it now and so it, it, it it's, it's totally it's about finding uh the joyous pursuits i'm going to go back to that's probably gonna be the title of the video please I really love dude, that please do but but i i i as I've gotten more politically involved, active and aware over the last years and gone through a big sea change in my outlook on the world, just being a kid raised in a conservative small town and, and, and come to LA and just kind of slowly, but steadily kind of finding a different way to look at the world. I still go to the fact that, um, I don't like it when, if there's something going on in Texas, if some law is passed in Texas and there's this fuck Texas mentality, that to me ain't right. That to me is not the way to approach it. That's to me really disregarding a lot of people who love that state, who are good in that state, who don't love the law or want to find different ways to approach it. And, and is, is the it's the unraveling of kindness to me. And, and yeah. it's antithetical to some of the things you might be trying to accomplish on a certain uh, political uh, journey. So I, I'm with you on, on uh, and totally. comics see that. Comics do see that. It sometimes tweaks their brains. It's a different conversation I could have of, they right. feel like, no, nah, I can say these horrible things because people are laughing. And I think it's a different conversation. But what you're saying is you get to see people at their best, which is experiencing joy and laughter. Yeah, that's true. And then also, too, um, people just want to be funny and cut loose. And, they, you know, when you think about how much of politics is people's everyday life, it's, it's not much. Yeah. They think about, like, going to work and uh, being home in time for their kid's soccer game and then maybe going out for pizza afterwards. They're not. They're not out there, you know, reading the, 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 the headlines every day. They're just, they're just not. Yeah. And what I would love to hear people talk about is empathy and respect yeah. more than anything else. Hey, you know what? I, um, I don't agree with you, but I, 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 I understand where you're coming from. So if you repeat your point after saying, I, I don't agree or that you, you're telling me information as if I don't understand. Yeah. You know what I mean? You get that a lot. Well, you don't know. You, you get, you're like, well, no, no, I understand. I just, this is the way I feel. Yeah. So I, I don't think um, having some sympathy for someone who's not in your exact situation is, is woke. It's just like, Hey brother, I I'm, I'm on this ride with you, sister. I'm on this ride with you. Everyone's experiencing things that no one knows anything about. Yeah. Be cool. Just be cool. Empathy is the is the great is the great uh, uh, tool that uh, I think can 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 truly change a lot of things, and that that was one of the things in my life. I was never uh, never an a hole. I wasn't a jerk. I didn't treat people bad. I was I, I, I very I, kind, very kind. But like, uh, it's so easy to um, 
put that or uh, in something my, my pal and podcast partner joseph scrimshaw said is is it's easy for people to look around and have empathy for those in their circle it's harder to apply it to a bigger cause group or person and i just think if you can connect with that and and uh, and a lot of it has to do with so I, I get angry i've been angry the last few years and and it's okay to be angry but h- how do you focus that like uh, I, I, uh, this is a big gear shift change, but like, uh, and, and, and talking to people locked in and, and locked in on conspiracy theories, like me yelling at them or hitting them up, upside the head with a hammer, as opposed to try to approach them with reason, <laughs> calmness and kindness and empathy. Sure. It's two different sure. ways of approaching it. And, and I right. really like what you're saying about that. There. Yeah. I, I'm still kind of working on this bit, but it was, uh, this happened recently. I was at the, uh, the pharmacy and, this woman was there with like her two-year-old toddler and her toddler like kind of like wandered off. And when she came back, she had like an armful of stuffed toys and she was eh, looking up at her mom and her mom was like, we're not going to get you all those toys. And I was just like, what would the world be like if we just treated everyone like a toddler? <laughs> like, You're not going to do your own research. Come on. You know, and it, whatever the, the point of view is, if you said it with just like, mm, I don't know, come on, mm. come on. It just really, it really, really made me laugh because no one's mean to kids. Yeah. Yeah, you know, they they take care of them. They you know, yeah, have it, you we know. all reach their level. Yeah, be like be childlike. Uh, yeah, but one thing, and I this I I, I do want to as we start to close there. Um, I do I mentioned it up top, and, and people are going to think uh, it was a weird obtuse reference, but I think I can't remember again. You and I have been in circles, and you you fly in and out of everyone's lives over years and years, years and years. Town town long enough, it comes back in, and it's seasons of of uh, 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 friendships and interactions. But I think I was, I don't know. I definitely know I maybe wasn't following you on point because you just don't, ah, yeah. And I suddenly saw your tweet popped up in my screen and you were responding to to uh, uh, you know, probably some alt-right a-hole, but you just wrote diarrhea. And I remember okay. I liked it. And then that that is this response. And you're you're this hyper intelligent, thoughtful, <laughs> empathetic human being. But that I saw that I was like, that's the only response to any of these situations. <laughs> and you could almost write a book on every one of your tweets that was diarrhea, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. Well, you know, even that I, I that's kind of you to say. I've even backed off engaging the trolls in that in in that way you know especially now i don't even respond yeah i i I heard it said don't feed the bears yeah it's hard when some of the bears come knocking on your door and want to yank you out in the streets uh and 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 take away your rights or at least the rights of others but but yes sure i I sure and and now that it's it's x whatever it is it's the bears are only more ravenous but uh, i just Uh, i just remember dying laughing because i saw it once and i was like "Ah, that's funny and then i saw that no you this you had done it for a while and this was a it's a, <laughs> to use the word recurring is uh, <laughs> accurate. It's a uh, spot on. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's been a lot of fun talking with uh, talking with you, Matt. And and I uh, I want the people uh, out there listening to uh, check this book out and check out the comedy, Matt. He's got he's got a YouTube channel. I want you to subscribe to, and you get you can see you can see the bit that maybe he looks back at and thinks he doesn't like i don't know you can tell you can comment that he's not all right so uh, again uh, uh, the book is uh, have i seen you in anything great question for an actor uh true hollywood stories from a guy that seems familiar available on amazon just search matt knutson and you'll find it uh i want to shout out our buddy mark ellis says hello and and, and mark ellis what was the time that you played thomas jefferson and he played alexander hamilton in some short film he's very proud of <laughs> mark's not proud of a lot of things but he's like tell matt i remember that and somewhere <laughs> that's that's great um any final words bad about the book uh where you're doing comedy or uh just uh you know uh how not to uh, tweet to the word diarrhea constantly. I don't know. Uh, yeah, those are all great questions. I would just say anyone wants to find me, uh, uh, hit me up on the tree, link tree slash Matt Knudsen that has uh, links to all of my show dates, my comedy albums, my dry bar special, the book, uh, YouTube. Like, There's like 10 links. So I was just like, I've got to have this like, easily accessible thing yeah so i put it all there linktree.com slash matt knutson and i really try and stay engaged on on social yeah. if people are nice yes because i think if there's nice comments they need to be reciprocated and if you're a troll i i just ignore you yeah 
Uh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I love with, with, uh, things like Linktree and now streaming, uh, with television and films, we've just recreated cable and websites. In other words, we've got exactly <laughs> where we were. I need one spot to tell I me mean, like a website. Well, a link tree. It's a link tree. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah, so you know what we should do in the streaming thing? Instead of making 20 shows in 20 episodes at once, we should just make one and see if people like it. Yeah. Oh, you mean a pilot? A pilot. Yeah, 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 yeah. We've discovered that without commercials, we can't make money. Ah, uh, you mean like the thing you got rid of in cable? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. absolutely. Totally. Uh, totally. But I would just say uh, be cool and have fun and uh, say yes as often as possible. I, mm. I truly believe yes is the gateway to adventure. The gateway to adventure is yes. There you heard it right there. The truth from Matt Knudsen, who's on his own joyous pursuits in life. Uh, Thanks for hanging out, all of you out there. Don't forget to uh, like, subscribe if you're watching on YouTube. If you're listening on the podcast side, thank you very much. Check out my Patreon page, patreon.com slash kindapsock. It's all down below. I'll probably put a link. There's there's like two link trees in there, and I'll put Matt's in there as well. Uh, Also, uh, 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 on October 10th, depending on where you listen to this, my first comedy album, uh, EP recorded live in London one night. We had, we had one night, and I'll tell you, it ain't perfect. And I had to get over that because it was one night of fun in London, and it's out there. Uh, look forward a special edition available on Bandcamp as well. We'll see y'all next time here on the Blathering Cup.